Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture actually I will prove uh, Cartan's criterion for solubility and semi-simplicity. Uh, for that purpose uh, we need to recall uh, what we have done in the last class which is actually primary decomposition theorem. So, let me actually uh, state the jordan chevalier decomposition so which is a very important consequence of this uh, primary decomposition theorem. So, I will state the result so that way you can actually recall what we have done. So, as before we take V to be a finite dimensional space over complex numbers and then we take T to be element of this endomorphism of V. So, then we actually prove the following. So, there exist unique elements S and N from this endomorphism of V satisfying the following conditions. The first condition T can be written as S plus N. The second condition S is semi simple, N is nil potent the third condition so both both of them actually commute with each other and they also commute with uh, t so we actually proved somewhat stronger so we proved that there exists polynomials p of x and q of x such that this capital s and capital n they are given by this polynomial in the t Okay, so, there exist P of x, Q of x inside C x such that this capital S is given by P of t and capital N is given by Q of t. So, in that proof we actually indeed uh, proved that this P of x and Q of x they can be chosen so that the constant terms are being 0. Okay. In particularly we can assume P of 0 and Q of 0 both are 0. So, now it is very clear that both S and N commutes with uh, T as well as they commute with each other. So, we proved that there exists unique S and N satisfying these three properties. So, that kind of decomposition we called it as Chevalier Jordan Chevalier decomposition, Jordan Chevalier decomposition of this capital T. So, now once we have this decomposition, then it is clear that if we have these three spaces, let us say A is contained in B, B is contained in B or subspaces such that T maps B to A. So, then we can immediately conclude S and N both actually map B to A. So, S of B again map to A and N of B is also mapped to A. Why? Because both S and N both are polynomial in T without any constant terms. So, because of that if T maps B to A then S and N both actually must map B to A. So, these are some consequence immediate consequence of this jordan chevalier decomposition. So, indeed we proved uh, this existence uh, of this jordan chevalier decomposition using what is called primary decomposition okay so which i am not uh, going to recall so for us what is important is this uh, jordan chevalier decomposition so now once we have uh, the notion of jordan chevalier decomposition we can actually uh, ask similar notions for any uh, given operator and then it is adjoint operator. Okay. So, here is a lemma. So, in case 
we have some x in endomosm of V and then assume that the dimension V is finite dimensional. So, we can also write let us say x equal to x s plus x n which is the Jordan decomposition of this x ok. This is the Jordan Chevalier decomposition of x. Then we can just apply the add map to these uh, elements. So, then we have add x being equal to add x s plus add x n ok. So, now what we expect naturally we expect this being the Jordan decomposition of add x. So, then this is the Jordan decomposition of add x. So, let us prove this. So, we can see that uh, this x being x s plus x n. So, so to prove that this add x equal to add x s plus add x n is actually the Jordan Chevalier decomposition. We need to first verify add x n is being nilpotent and add x s is actually semi simple and so on. So, let us verify one by one. So, so we already seen that if x is nilpotent then add x is nilpotent. So, this is something we already seen if x is nilpotent. So, then that implies add x is nilpotent. So, the way we proved add x you can write it as add x of y equal to x y minus y x. So, which is just a difference between two maps left to multiplication and right multiplication. So, if we take this y this is L x of y minus R x of y. So, since L x and R x commute and both L x and R x they are nilpotent. So, the difference of these two operators should be nilpotent. So, that implies that R x nilpotent that is how we prove. So, this implies add x is nilpotent. So, that means add x n is nilpotent. So, that is no worry. So, we need to check add x s y that is uh, semi simple. So, let us say we have a basis v 1 etcetera v n. So, this is the basis of capital V and with respect to that x s looks like diagonal. So, this is the basis. So, this is diagonal. So, in particularly x s. So, with respect to this basis v 1 etcetera v n we have a basis for this uh, endomorphism of v. That basis we denote it by E i j. So, this is the basis of let us say endomorphism of V. So, then with respect to that this x s the matrix can be written as some lambda 1 E 1 1 plus etcetera plus lambda n E n n where this diagonal matrix looks like lambda 1 etcetera lambda n 0. So, now you can see that if I compute this add x s on this E i j. So, then it is going to give us x s E i j minus E i j x s. So, which is equal to lambda i times E i j minus lambda j times E i j. So, that means this is lambda i minus lambda j times E i j. So, on the basis add x s acts as scalar 
lambda i minus lambda j times E i j and this is true for all i j. So, that means add axis is actually diagonalizable. and that implies axis is add axis is semi simple. So, this proves that uh, this add axis is semi simple and this add x n is nil potent. So, uh, we have this uh, decomposition of add x into semi simple plus nil potent to prove it is actually the Jordan Chevrolet decomposition, uh, we need to check. So, these two operators actually commutes with the x and as well as they are polynomial in add x. Okay. So, for that we can just see that add x x s will be just equal to add x bracket add x s. So, that means bracket x x s is 0. So, that will imply that add x bracket add x s is 0. Similarly, you can see that add x and add x n. So, they also commute because that is also same as add of x x n. So, this proves that add x commutes with add x s as well as add x n. Similarly, you can see that add x s and add x n they also commute as add x s bracket add x n is nothing but add of x s x n which is 0. So, this means whatever uh, that we wrote these conditions are all satisfied add x is nothing but add x s plus add x n and add x s is semi simple and add x n is nil potent. So, to prove uniqueness we need to say that there are polynomials such that uh, add x s can be written as polynomial in add x as well as add x n is written as polynomial in add x. So, it is enough to prove it for add x s because add x n is nothing but add x minus add x s. Okay. So, to prove the third part claim is there exists p of x or let us call it p ej inside c ej such that p of add x is nothing but add x s. Okay. So, this is again one can uh, prove it using the similar ideas that we established uh, before. So, to prove this, so we need to actually invoke that uh, primary decomposition theorem. So, we can easily see that uh, this how this add access is actually acting on this uh, E i j which is the which is the basis. Okay. Again this basis E i j it is uh, indeed obtained from by fixing the basis of this capital V. So, which has this uh, diagonal entries lambda 1 etcetera lambda n. So, I will leave it to you to check because this is these arguments are going to again appear very often. Okay. So, it is actually a correct place for you to actually sit and check. So, if we take this lambda i's which are eigen values for x okay, that is the relationship between the eigen values of x s and x. Okay. So, now we have this basis v 1 etcetera v n of this capital V with respect to this basis the operator x s written in, in terms of this diagonal operator lambda 1 etcetera lambda n. Now, using this we, ca we, we can see that this add x s how it acts on this E i j. So, again it is very explicitly given in terms of this lambda i minus lambda j acting on this E i j. 
So, now using this information you can locate a polynomial p of z such that this p of ad x is actually equal to ad x. I will leave it you to check this because this is very important uh, point. Okay. So, now this proves that given uh, this Chevalier decomposition, Chevalier decomposition of this x, we will be able to get Chevalier decomposition of uh, this uh, Jordan Chevalier decomposition of this ad x. Okay. So, now uh, we will actually uh, go back and then verify this uh, one of the fact which is again like uh, uh, appears very similar to the one that we specified now. Okay. Again, so if you think about it, uh, this is uh, that this locating this polynomial is nothing to do with uh, only these eigenvalues. We can also choose some arbitrary complex numbers. Again, we can use this Chinese remainder theorem to actually locate this polynomial. So, let us try to do that okay, which will be very useful again later. So, let me state that this as one lemma. So, what is this lemma says? So, if we have uh, this uh, operator, let us call it x again acting on this finite dimensional vector space. So, now if we write this minimal polynomial of this x as some x minus lambda 1 power a 1 etcetera, maybe I will use different notation. So, let me call it z. z minus lambda 1 power a 1 etcetera, z minus lambda r power a r. So, then we already proved that this v can be written as direct sum of this generalized eigenspaces. So, v can be written as v 1 direct sum etcetera direct sum v r, where this v i is the generalized eigenspace which is given by the kernel of x minus lambda i identity power this a i. So, now what are we going to do? So, we just take some arbitrary complex numbers call it mu 1 etcetera mu r inside your complex numbers. So, now using this mu 1 etcetera mu r we can actually construct an operator that is acting on capital V. Okay, we can take some operator call it T dash. So, that operator is just acting on V i by this scalar let us say mu i. So, then that operator okay, so which we actually if you think about it that operator will be of the form mu 1 identity on v 1 plus etcetera plus mu r identity on v r. So, this is the operator that we are talking about. So, what one can prove? We can prove that e even this operator which is written as a diagonal operator or diagonalizable operator for this operator also there is a polynomial p of z inside c z such that this p of x will be equal to this operator. So, this is something we did it for the lambda i's okay, for the eigenvalues lambda i's, but now what we are saying it does not matter whatever this diagonal lysable operator that you take for any operator you will be able to write this operator as polynomial in x. So, it is a very, very, very strong statement. Again this also just follows from Chinese remainder theorem nothing else. You can actually use the previous proof to prove the same thing. So, let us prove this because this is very important uh, statement that we made. So, what we do we actually locate this polynomial okay, using Chinese remainder theorem 
choose this polynomial p z such a way that this p z is congruent to mu i modulo this z minus lambda i power a okay? and this is true for each i 1 to r. So, since this z minus lambda i power a i they are all actually uh, pairwise relatively prime. So, we will be able to choose this p of h p of z using Chinese remainder theorem such that this p of z is congruent to mu i modulo z minus lambda i power a. In particularly this p of z can be written as mu i plus some q i of z as before times this z minus lambda i power a i. So, now by applying this uh, evaluation operator you can see that this is actually same as p x equal to mu i identity plus q i of x x minus lambda i power a i lambda i power a i. So, now if I take some vector capital uh, sorry small v in capital V i you can see that if you evaluate p x of V i then you get exactly mu i V i plus q i of x times x minus lambda i power a i V i okay, some small V i in capital V. Note that this is going to be 0 as capital V i being the kernel of x minus lambda i power a i. So, that would imply p of x v i is equal to mu i v i. So, that means p of x restricted to capital V i is nothing but mu i times identity on this capital V i. So, this proves that uh, this p, p of x is nothing but mu 1 identity v 1 plus etcetera plus mu r identity v r. Okay. So, this is uh, somewhat very important. So, in particularly if you take basis of this uh, capital V i and then uh, take the disjoint union of those basis and then write down this matrix of this p of x with respect to that basis then the matrix will look like uh, this diagonal matrix mu 1 identity v 1 etcetera mu r identity v r. Okay. So, this is how the matrix will look like diagonal matrix. So, this is something one can do it with any mu i's. So, in practice what we do we actually take this complex conjugate of this uh, uh, lambda i's okay, then we actually apply it for that. So, as an immediate corollary what we can see, so here is the immediate corollary. If I take x from this endomorphism of uh, v and then if you assume this dimension v is finite and the mat the minimal polynomial of uh, the minimal polynomial of this uh, x is given by z minus lambda 1 power a 1 etcetera z power minus lambda r power a r where this lambda 1 etcetera lambda r coming from c they are distinct complex numbers. So, then you can see that you can take mu 1 to be lambda 1 bar etcetera mu r to be lambda r bar. So, then by previous argument there exists polynomial p z in c z such that this p of z is equal to lambda 1 bar identity on v 1 plus etcetera plus lambda r bar identity on v r. So, this is how we actually get sorry this is p of x. So, the operator lambda 1 bar 1 v 1 x plus etcetera lambda r bar 1 v r. So, that is going to be equal to this p of x. So, 
So, there exists a polynomial such that not only that diagonal operator lambda 1 etcetera lambda r that is actually given in polynomial on our x, even this lambda 1 bar identity v 1 plus etcetera lambda r bar identity v r that is also given in polynomial of x. So, it is a very very strong statement. Now, this is uh, going to be used in uh, what follows. Okay. So, so let me just uh, use it. So, before that uh, we can actually uh, see that. Uh, so, if we write uh, this x as so this diagonal operator plus the nilpotent operator. So, this uh, new operator that we have constructed this lambda 1 bar etcetera lambda r bar. So, that is nothing but just x s bar. So, what is x s bar? So, x s bar is defined on this capital V. So, where x s bar on this V i is given by this lambda i bar identity V i. Okay. So, this is how one actually defines uh, this x s bar. So, which is uh, defined for this uh, diagonalizable operator x s. So, now uh, it is easy to check if we take this add x. So, which will be actually given by add x s plus add x n. So, we saw that if this is uh, x equal to x s plus x n is uh, Jordan Chevrolet decomposition. So, then this add x being equal to add x s plus add x n. So, that is also Jordan Chevrolet decomposition. So, in particularly we can talk about this add x s bar. So, if you think about it this add x s bar is given in terms of this uh, add x s bar. Okay. So, if you recall how this add x s acts on E i j. So, if you pick v 1 etcetera v n is the basis of capital V with respect to that basis if this x s is given by this is a diagonal matrix lambda 1 identity v 1 etcetera lambda r identity v r. So, then we saw that this add x s E i j is given by lambda i minus lambda j times E i j. So, this is the calculation that we did. So, in particularly if we take this add x s bar on E i j. So, this will be given by lambda i minus lambda j bar E i j. So, this will be the definition. So, that means this add x s bar E i j is nothing but lambda i bar minus lambda j bar times E i j. So, if you think about it this is exactly equal to uh, to this add x bar on this E i j because add x s bar is also is diagonal operator and if you do the calculation add x s bar on E i j is given by this uh, lambda i bar minus lambda j bar acting on this E i j. So, that implies this add x s bar is same as add x bar. Okay. So, this is a small side observation. So, now uh, we will use these observations uh, in order to prove this uh, Cartan criteria of for the solubility. So, before uh, getting into this uh, theorem, so first we will make some observation. So, we will see that uh, where this actually result is coming from. So, if we start with G being solubility algebra. So, then we know that uh, using Lee's theorem so, we will be able to actually uh, find a basis. So, you can assume G is being uh, subalgebra of this GLV. So, let us assume this is the case. So, then by using this least theorem, there exists a basis V1 etcetera Vn of this capital V such that this G is sitting inside this what is called this upper triangular matrices. 
T n comma c ok. This is all upper triangular matrices. So, this is what uh, we have seen using the least theorem. Now, if you think about it uh, because uh, the derived algebra of this upper triangular matrices is nothing but uh, strictly upper triangular matrices. So, this uh, since T of n comma c comma T of n comma c this sits inside what is called this uh, strictly upper triangular matrices. upper triangular matrices. So, we can see that the derived algebra G G is also sits inside this strictly upper triangular matrices. So, but it is not hard to see if I if we take capital A being upper triangular. and capital B being uh, strictly upper triangular. If we take the product capital A B, so then we can see that this must be strictly upper triangular. So, now using this observation you can see that if we take trace of this x y. So, trace of this x y where x is coming from g and then this y is coming from this derived algebra g g which is we call it g dash. Then you can see that the trace of x y must be 0. So, this is just direct consequence of least theorem because g there is a basis with respect to that basis the elements of G made into upper triangular. In particularly the derived algebra elements made into strictly upper triangular. So, if we take the product of those two elements then the trace must be 0 as the product being strictly upper triangular matrix. So, this is somewhat gives us some kind of trace condition to check whether given uh, your Lie algebra is soluble or not. Indeed, we will prove that this is one of the characterization for solubility. Okay. So, we have already seen many characterizations for solubility from the definitions. For example, we proved that G is soluble if and only if add G is soluble. So, this is something we already proved. Okay. So, now we want to actually get some other criterion which is somewhat practically applicable. So, for that purpose we will see that this condition that we have written here trace of x y being 0 for all x in g and y is in the derived algebra is one of the characterization for solubility. So, this is called actually uh, Carton's uh, first criterion. To prove this first criterion first we will actually do it for uh, what is called this linear subalgebras. Okay, then we will actually apply for the general uh, abstract Lie algebras. Okay, let us see how one can actually do this for uh, linear Lie algebra. So, as before we take V being finite dimensional vector space and G being subalgebra of this uh, GL of V. So, suppose uh, we have this trace of x y being 0 for all x y in G. Okay. So, then we can prove that G must be soluble. Note that here we have relaxed a bit the condition. We are demanding that the trace of x y is being 0 for all x y is in G. We will see later that uh, this relaxation is good enough to say that uh, G is being soluble. Okay. So, how do one prove this? So, in order to prove G being soluble it is enough to prove the derived algebra is being nilpotent. Okay. So, to prove G uh, dash the derived algebra is nilpotent. Okay. So, G dash which is uh, the bracket G G is nilpotent implies G is soluble. 
So, this is something we already saw. This is again one of the characterization of G being solvable using Lee's theorem. Now, G dash is nil potent comes from actually all the elements of G dash being nil potent. So, that is from Engel's theorem. Okay, from Engel's theorem. So, it is enough to prove that each element of this G dash is a nil potent operator, nil potent linear map. So, this is what we want to prove. So, in order to prove that what we do we use this uh, Jordan Chevalier decomposition. So, you take x being in G dash. So, then you write x equal to x s plus x n. So, this is your Jordan Chevalier decomposition. So, in order to prove that x is actually nil potent. So, we need to prove that uh, this x s the semi simple part is actually 0. Okay. So, what we do? So, we fix a basis since all these operators x, x s, x n all of them mutually commute. So, and since x s being diagonalizable and x n being nil potent. So, we will be able to fix a basis of V, okay, fix a basis of capital V. So, in which or with respect to that basis, so D is sorry x s is diagonal x s is diagonal and x n is nil potent. So, nil potent means it is actually strictly upper triangular is strictly upper triangular. So, this we can do because all these operators actually commute with each other. Okay. So, since uh, x s is diagonal, so we can call those diagonal entries to be lambda 1 etcetera lambda m. So, write this diagonal thing as lambda 1 etcetera lambda m, where m is the actually the dimension of the space. Okay. So, we fix the dimension of space to be m. So, now you can see that in order to prove this uh, d uh, sorry this x s being 0. So, to prove x s being 0 it is enough to prove enough to prove this lambda is are being 0. So, in order to prove this lambda is are being 0 because we are working over complex numbers what we will do we actually take indirect approach because we are going to use this trace criterion. So, we will actually try to prove that the summation lambda i lambda i bar that is being 0 for summing over i range from 1 to n. Okay. So, this is where we are actually kind of going to use this uh, trace criterion in order to prove lambda i are being 0. So, it is enough to prove the summation lambda i lambda i bar is 0. So, note that if we take this x s bar which is the matrix whose diagonal entries okay, again with respect to the same basis you can take it to be lambda 1 bar etcetera lambda m bar. So, now what happens? So, if you compute this trace the trace of this uh, x s bar times your x you can see that because x is nothing but x s plus x n and x s bar times x will be x s bar times x s plus x s bar x n. So, this is being strictly upper triangular matrix, this is being diagonal matrix you can see that the trace of x s bar times x is nothing but summation lambda i lambda i bar where i range from 1 to m. Okay. So, in order to prove that the summation lambda i lambda i bar 0. So, it is enough to prove the trace of x s bar times x is 0. But note that since this x is actually coming from this g dash which is the bracket g g. So, in particularly x can be written as summation some bracket 
y i is at i where i range from some 1 to k. So, in order to prove this trace of x s bar times x is 0, so it is enough to prove the trace of x s bar times this y i is at i this is being 0. Okay. So, it is enough to prove this. trace of x s bar times this uh, bracket y a is at i is being 0. But note that we already know this identity the trace of a times b c is equal to trace of a b bracket a b times c. So, now if we use this identity we can rewrite this trace into trace of x s bar y i bracket times e z i. So, this is how we can rewrite. So, note that this y i and e z i they are all elements of this y i e z i they are all coming from your g. Okay. So, now to prove this trace of bracket x s bar y i uh, times e z i is being 0, uh, you can actually see that this x s bar y i. So, that is actually element of this uh, g again. Okay. If this is true, so then we know that trace of this bracket x s bar y i e z i is being 0. Why? Because this is element of g and this is element of g for element of uh, g trace of x y being 0 that is what given to us. Okay. So, it is enough to prove that uh, this uh, x s bar add x s bar maps this g to g. Okay. So, this is equivalent to saying add x s bar maps g to g, but why this is true? So, this is you can see that uh, add x s bar first of all is equal to add x s capital bar. Okay. So, we already seen from our earlier lemma. So, there exists a polynomial such that this add x s bar is actually given by polynomial in add x. So, now because this add x maps g to g, so that implies this polynomial in add x also maps g to g. So, that means this add x bar is also maps g to g. So, that proves that add x bar is actually maps g to g. So, that implies this bracket x s bar y i is being in g. So, that means this trace of this x s bar times y i bracket y i is at i 0. So, which, which says that the trace of x s times x is actually 0. So, that proves that summation lambda i lambda i bar is 0. So, that implies that lambda i is 0. Okay. So, it is actually a very tricky proof, So, but it is really proves that uh, this trace condition is indeed gives us solubility. Okay. So, now how to actually use this uh, uh, condition which is uh, diff which is given for this linearly al algebra to abstractly algebra. So, we will just use this adjoint map and then we know that L is soluble if and only if add L is soluble. So, using that we can actually uh, get the first criterion for the solubility. So, here is the theorem. It is indeed corollary of what we have seen before. So, we take G being a complex Lie algebra. Okay, this is uh, Lie algebra over complex numbers. So, then G is soluble if and only if trace of add x composition add y is 0 for all x in g and y in g dash. So, this is the trace condition for solubility. So, we already proved one way if g is soluble then using least theorem you can actually uh, prove that like there exists a basis 
with respect to that basis elements of this add x, x is in g, they all sit inside this uh, upper triangular matrices. Okay. So, it's T and C. So, now using this uh, information, this is just by Lee's theorem. So, as before, you can actually see that the trace of add x composition add y will be 0 for all x in G and y in G does. So, this is just a consequence of this Lee's theorem. For the converse, if you assume this trace of add x composition add y is being 0 for all x in G and y in G dash, in particularly this is true for uh, add x composition add y equal to 0 for all x y being in G dash. Okay. Now, G dash is nothing but what? G dash is nothing but the bracket G G. So, which is uh, if you take the add of this, so then this is add of this uh, G dash which is add bracket G G which is nothing but the bracket of add G add G. So, which is the bracket of add G dash, okay? add G dash. So, that means you can see that this trace condition uh, add x composition add y being 0 for all x y in G dash immediately implies add G dash is soluble. So, since add G dash is soluble, so that will imply G dash is soluble. So, since G dash is soluble that implies G is soluble. So, since solubility behaves very well with respect to the quotient, so we can see that un under joint representation. So, add G dash is being soluble implies G is being soluble. So, that proves that uh, G is soluble if and only if this uh, it is enough to check this trace condition trace of add x composition add y is 0 for all x in G and uh, y in G dash. So, this is a very important uh, criterion to check solubility. So, we will see later that again like this trace the condition is actually somewhat plays important role in order to actually check uh, uh, what is called semi simplicity and other things. I will stop here, I will continue next class with the criterion for the semi simplicity. Thank you.